o'clock. Welcome to the school committee meeting of Wednesday, November 1st, 2017. Just a reminder, we're being recorded live for uh, rebroadcast, and we will start with the Pledge of Allegiance. Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States Tonight we have Sophia Cherrier and Abigail Damasio from the middle school for our student representatives. Good evening, everyone. My name is Sophia Cherrier and I'm here with Abigail Damasio. We are both eighth grade student council members on the executive board. Tonight <laughs> we are here to share about the events currently taking place in Douglas Middle School. On October 17th, some eighth grade students took a trip to Waters Corporation in Milford, Mass. There, students took part in a facility tour, discussed with employees, and watched a presentation. They were informed about multiple STEM career areas in global manufacturing and spent the day there exploring. Another science field trip was a trip to the Tufts STEM conference on Saturday, October 21st. This was open to students in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade, and a total of 10 students attended. Students were able to choose three different workshops to participate in. In our building, the Douglas Middle School Lego Robotics teams have been finding ways to fundraise and donate money for hurricane relief. The water buffaloes have greatly profited from selling reusable water bottles for $6 a piece, and they used the money to aid the victims of Hurricane Harvey. A total of 95 were sold. They will be donating $385 to the American Red Cross for Texas. The other Lego, Lego Robotics team the Torrential Tigers, are raising funds for the victims of Hurricane Maria through a tournament of, of a dodgeball-based game known as Medic Ball. To enter the tournament, students must buy a $1 <coughs> raffle ticket and enter the lottery drawing. 30 students will be randomly selected to participate in this tournament on November 9th. The students will oppose the faculty and the parents. Douglas Middle School students have been participating in many fall sports such as cross country, volleyball, soccer, and golf. All of these seasons are just about over, but each team had a very amazing run. The boys and girls cross country teams ran at the DVC championship at Sutton on Saturday, October 28th. The boys middle school team came away with the trophy, winning the meet against five other teams by one point with Colin Squire coming in second place out of 39 runners. Evan Wheeler in fourth, Brian Wheeler in ninth, Colton Howard in 11th, all uh, earning medals. Colin J.C., Jonah Rosencrantz, and Anthony DeMeo helped the team pull off this win. Every place counted. Zoe Bean medaled in the girls' race, coming sixth out of 36 runners. Winter basketball will be having tryouts after the Monday after Thanksgiving. Representatives from North Douglas High School and DVC came and presented to the class of 2022 during the month of October. On October 31st, 86 eighth grade students took the opportunity to visit Blackstone Valley Tech. On Tuesday, November 7th, we will have a school-wide performance of I Am Dirt, a one-man show written and produced by actor and comedian John Morello, which touches on important topics of drugs, bullying, depression, and growing up. He will be performing on stage for about 60 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer forum after, afterward for another 30 minutes in the auditorium. We will be having two short weeks in November with Thanksgiving and conferences being held November 15th in the evening and the 16th and 17th in the afternoon. Notices were sent home in all of the grades a couple of weeks ago for parents to sign up online. These will be half days. This past month has been very productive for the entire school. The fall sports wrapped up their seasons with impressive finishes and many new fundraisers arose to help those in need. Thank you for your time and have a lovely e evening. Thank you very much. Good stuff going on. So we've um, changed the agenda a little bit and we've uh, put the public comment and communications up front so that um, you don't have to sit through everything if, um, you know if you have other things to do tonight. So if there's anybody in the audience who has anything that they want to bring to our attention. Sure, Mr. Donnacle. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, Al Donato, choral director, here on behalf of the music department. We are here tonight 
uh, seeking approval for a trip we would like to take with our band and chorus in April of next year. Uh, our destination is Philadelphia to participate in a music festival. May I interrupt you for one sure. second? Because we, we, you are on the agenda. Oh, okay. So should I go back? Yeah, could we'll get to that. I'm sorry. I'll be back. It's more like um, <laughs> public communications instead of audi you know audience communications that we've had so in the I, past. If I speak now, I can leave then because I have other things. You may not. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean to confuse you. <laughs> um, so, seeing nobody else. Uh, we'll move to the accounts payable report. Um, Brett. Sure. Um, so this is our first um, report out since we changed our process for approving um, our accounts payable warrants. Um, so I had about a dozen warrants or so um, that were approved. Was it last week? I can't remember now. Yeah, it was last. Two yeah, weeks ago. Last, two, weeks. two weeks ago. Yeah, thank you. Two uh, weeks ago. Um, in a total of $288,222.63. Um, you all have the details um, of that, um, other than the actual um, invoices and receipts, but th there, is, there is detail behind each one of the individual warrants there um, for your review. Um, do you have any questions? Um, there was really nothing um, to comment on um, within the warrants. I mean, it was, was in order. Thank you. I think that really helps streamline that process. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so it worked out. So you don't need well. three signatures then? Nope. Um, we uh, voted to have Brett as the designee to sign. Right. And um, that way we're not just sitting here going, he actually will go to the office and take the time. We still do have the option to go to the office, look through all the paperwork. Right. Um, but it kind of streamlines the process at the table. Yeah, and I felt, you know, at, le at least for me, I feel like the, we were doing it at the end of the meetings. We were particularly with like taking 15, 20 minutes with it. I didn't feel like I had enough time with it. Um, I think I spent over an hour with them on the day that I did this and uh, felt much more comfortable, you know, that I was able to kind of mm -hmm. go through the kind of detail that I really wanted to go through. Mm -hmm. so. Okay. Um, so how does this work now? So we changed the format. So it says consent agenda. Does that go to you or is that? Um, I think yes, right? Yeah. Okay. Um, so consent agenda, it just means that the, anything under there is what we need to vote on. So um, the first up is the out of state chorus trip to Philadelphia. <laughs> For real. For real. <laughs> Hi. Hello again. Hi again. <laughs> Start from the beginning. Um, so uh, we're here tonight seeking uh, your approval to take our abandoned course on a trip to Philadelphia in April, uh, I think it's 28th, 29th, and 30th, 2018, to participate in a music festival uh, where it, it will be a ratings festival, a little different than some of the festivals we normally go to, which are competitive. Uh, we haven't always been satisfied with those, so we were looking for something different, and we're really excited about this opportunity. Uh, this festival, uh, is different from the others in that instead of the usual 10 to 15 minute wrap up workshop that the judges do with you after you perform, uh, this one has a master class uh, which is an hour long where they work with the group to help them prepare for the performance. It takes, takes place in advance of the adjudication. So we're really thinking that's going to offer our students a much better educational opportunity and uh, they'll, they'll get a lot more out of the festival that way. Uh, we will be staying, although we're going to Philadelphia for the festival and some of the activities, we'll be staying just across the border in New Jersey. Um, in the, um, the hotel that is listed here is the one that the travel agent anticipates we will be in. Uh, that will be confirmed once we're actually registered in the festival. And, uh, and if anything changes, we will update you on that information. Uh, but there, she listed four and they're all right in the same area. Um, she's well aware of the types of properties we'd like to use in terms of um, the accommodations and the security for, for the students, that's always a concern. Uh, we anticipate taking uh, roughly 80 students, about nine chaperones. The cost is $500 per student. Um, actually, the cost is higher than that. Uh, but I'd like to recognize our booster group uh, for their continued support. They have donated a large sum of money to defray the cost, so that the hope is that all of our students will be able to go by bringing the cost down. Uh, so I think they deserve some recognition for that. Um, this trip is also a little different because uh, normally our trips go Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Uh, this one, our performances are based on Sunday, so we would be leaving on Saturday doing the festival activities on Sunday, 
um, Monday morning doing some, <coughs> excuse me, doing some sightseeing in the area before heading home. So we would need permission to be uh, out of school on Monday. Uh, we would tell all of our students they're all expected to be in school on Tuesday. That's, that's the norm. Um, be happy to answer any questions that you have. <coughs> So this can't count as a school day, even though they're doing an educational sort of experience. That's not my call. Yeah. So it could, it could be it could be recognized as an excused absence. Could be. So just because, but they're not physically. I mean, right. kids go on field trips all the time, and it's counted as a day of school. Correct. Right. They have to make up the work. They're not making up right. the day. Mm -hmm. Does anybody have any other questions? So I'll be looking for a motion to approve it. I'll make a motion to approve the out of state. Oh, out of state course trip to Philadelphia on 428, 2018. Second. <coughs> Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Uh, just to note, I know on the agenda it's listed as the chorus trip. It will be the music department band and chorus attending. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank and you. thank you to the band boosters for helping to yep. defray some of that cost. Thank you all. Elliot, nice to see you. <coughs> Next is the proposal for a special education power professional at the Douglas Middle School. How is everyone? Good, how are you? I'm very well, thank you. All right, so um, tonight we are proposing a full-time middle school um, special education paraprofessional for the Flex Center. Um, I'm gonna give you a breakdown. I'm gonna start with population. Um, we currently have three students with one-to-one -one paraprofessionals within the Flex Center. We have 16 students. The students are in three different grade levels. This includes five general education classes, each with their own lunch, recess, and specialist schedule. There are multiple students that require the diverse interventions provided within the Flex Center. The student social emotional diagnoses and overall needs are extensive this year. Current staff, we have one full-time special education teacher, one full-time ABA, one full-time paraprofessional, and three full-time one-to-one ABAs. So the current issues that stand are all the students require varying levels of inclusion. The numbers of students are not allowing for preparation of materials and curriculum. The teacher currently has no prep time or lunch. The Flex Center paraprofessionals and the teachers are responsible for the children throughout the entire school day, meaning that they're not having any time without the kids. Um, there is minimal time for planning prep time to gather the necessary work samples to prepare for the assessments. So that means there are collaboration levels with general education. There is a minimal time, as I just said, with general ed. Concerns, student support needs shall be continual in order to support the social and emotional needs of the students within the program. Daily decisions about the students attending an inclusion lesson shall be based on a child's needs not the ability to appropriately support the child with a staff member, meaning that we can't have an expectation that a student would stay in the Flex Center because we don't have a Flex Center paraprofessional or teacher to go into inclusion with the student. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. The district is responsible to meet the service delivery grids determined by the student's educational team. At that point, I get into the Mass General Law, which I don't have to review with you guys. And lastly, the um, contractually all educators require one prep time and lunch time, and this is not occurring right now. So to move to the financial impact, I will look to Mrs. Keegan. Um, in your uh, agenda item summary, the estimated amount for this position, I had based it here on a D2 on the salary scale, and that would be $17,900. And the, basically the only funding source that we have right now is circuit breaker. So if you were to vote um, this position this evening, if you were to approve it, 
it would leave a a balance on projected through june thirtieth in circuit breaker with everything up to date at nine hundred seventy eight thousand one fifty nine that's including the a b a s that we previously on that you previously approved and also the additional um, tuition amounts that we added in earlier as well. What did you say that? Is it 9000 $978,159. Okay. Um, and I do want to give some further justification that I did not include on this. Um, in speaking today with, with uh, middle school professionals, what we were discussing was um, the needs within the flex center at this time that could not be anticipated when Laura and I were looking at um, staffing for the flex center. So basically we've had situations throughout the school year where student needs have increased, um, whether it's the social emotional piece or the academic piece. And we've had to put kids in different classroom situations that we didn't anticipate, meaning that we cannot cover the service delivery grids because of the students' needs. Does that make sense? It does to me. <laughs> no, it does to you. <laughs> uh, we are only here this evening after many, many, many hours, many, many meetings of discussions, many ways of looking at how to serve these students and what are our needs and how to best use our resources, which and everyone's done their best to give us what we have. Um, we still just find ourselves absolutely stretched um, as far as we can go. And we found that this is, we, we just, we couldn't operate without this additional staff member. Um, if, I, I may have missed it, Mrs. Urquhart, but and a lot of this has fallen on the general education teachers as well who have their hands full as well, they have larger class sizes. Um, sixth grade is doing great. Uh, they're doing phenomenal work this year. Having those five teachers is, is bearing wonderful fruit. But again, there's, there's still a very heavy load and it is the beginning of November and we are saying there's no way we could sustain the needs without this additional staff. So this, we, we come to you knowing it's, it's a hard, um, is a hard pill that we're asking for everyone to swallow, but we wouldn't, it, this represents <coughs> many, many hours and meetings of trying to figure out the best way possible, and we, we, we need this extra body uh, for the benefit of the students, benefit of the, the teachers, benefit of the school, um, and the district, and that's, uh, I just thought it was important to add that to the decision-making process. Is that fair, Mrs. Urquhart? Is that if you guys have any questions, um, we certainly embrace them because it does it does feel like we're coming up here more often now. Well, it's I mean, you guys quicker. make a, a, a valid point. I mean, uh, if a teacher's not getting their lunch in, in their prep period, we can't be allowing that to happen, so. We can't, we can't. And I'm not gonna say more than that because right. the teachers are as important as, right. as the kids, but uh, comparable to that, you know, the kids are getting to the point where um, the services are being compromised. Mm -hmm. And, you know, within a flex center environment, it's, it's a real gray area. You never know um, what sort of social emotional episode is gonna pop up, which is going to impact and make you short staff. Mm -hmm. um, and at this point, we've, we've had way too many scenarios, so. Does anyone have any questions? So I'd be looking for a motion to approve this. I'll make a motion to approve one FTE special education paraprofessional for the middle school up to 17,900 to be initially funded from the circuit breaker revolving fund. Second. Um, that, that, I do have a question. Why does it say initially funded? Oh, I, uh, yeah, I know. That's something new that I put in the last time and, and um, <coughs> because oh, how do I explain? I'm trying to think how I explained it the last time because it gets Only it gets so complicated. It felt weird. Um, so. <laughs> because it, it does it. Um, let's put it this way: when we get to the end of the year, 
I end up having to move things around, okay, whether it be, you know, school choice, um, general fund, circuit breaker. So that's why I decided to add the word initially because I didn't want you to feel like I was misleading you or anything like that. But um, so I just added that word because obviously this is a funding source now. But when we get to the end of the year, I may be able to basically set us up in a better position for the following year by moving things around. As you know, we bring the general fund down to zero. Um, that's usually between school choice and general fund, but not 100% not of the time. Sometimes there are some adjustments with circuit breaker as well. Does that make sense? Yeah. We should probably finish the vote so we can. I thought we did. No, no I need a second. Oh, it was second. Oh, yeah. Yep. Oh, we did? Yeah. yeah. Any further discussion? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so could you explain, the, uh, so you're saying that there's 978 just so that people are clear as to the situation here. It's not like we have $978,000 just sitting there waiting to be spent. Can you explain the 978 a little bit more as far as circuit breaker. the circuit breaker goes to like the general public so they understand that this isn't like we have that. So all that you mean the whole so circuit breaker used, revolving fund? Where right. it can be used. Is what yeah. Yeah. Are you asking where it can be used or how it can yeah, be used? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, the circuit breaker revolving fund can only be used on special education expenditures. Um, we get circuit breaker reimbursement every year. We talk about it every year during our budget process. Um, we give the balances we carry forward during our budget process. I update regularly on, you know, the balance forward. And I always update, too, on the expenditures that we've added to it. Um, we are bringing in one million one seventy four three twenty one this year. That was given by provided by DESE on 921. I updated the school committee at that time on, um, <clears throat> you know, what DESE was projecting that we would be receiving. Um, so the projected balance of 978.159 is the carryover balance, plus that amount that I just stated is um, coming in this year for reimbursement, minus what the school committee voted um, in the budget to be utilized from circuit breaker for special education. And as I stated earlier, the little bit of additional amounts too that you've approved in some subsequent meetings. And that will come down to 978.159 projected through June 30th at this time. Of course, things could, you know, as it does, we, you know, come through the year. If hopefully there won't be anything else, but if there is, um, that would probably be the likely funding source for any additional special education expenditures. And that's all that the circuit breaking could be used for, nothing else. And they can't be used for any um, special education transportation, only certain expenditures, but never for transportation. So, does that? Answer your question. Absolutely. I just wanted that clarification out there. So all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? So first of all, thank you. And second of all, you guys have been completely generous, lawful, and assisted us or have continued to assist us in being compliant over the years with these things. Again, because the frequency of, of me as well as the principals coming up here seems to be increasing. Um, I am happy to create any sort of report that you want to talk about, you know, the, the breakdown that I did um, for this scenario where you can understand the population, the staffing, the reasons behind our programs. I'm happy to provide you with any of that information at any time um, if that would be helpful in case we have to come forward in the future for anything else. Okay. Yeah, as, as you mentioned, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to think forward even towards the end of the year. I think that might be useful to sure. talk, you know, maybe some of them. Here was our baseline that we started the year with. Absolutely. All the additions that we had, and that we'll probably end up setting up your, for your baseline for sure. next year, I imagine. But it would be good to kind of see kind of I, how that baseline yeah. changes, you know, throughout the year. Absolutely. I think the increase in um, students who have moved into the district who have IEPs alone is some very interesting data. Yeah, for, so I think you guys we can look at each individual one of these and say, yeah, yeah this makes perfect sense, but to yeah. see them kind of compiled, I think, would, would be useful at, at some point. Agreed. Though. No, so. sure, we can absolutely do that. Thank you. All right, okay. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So now I'll send this over to you, Mr. Means. Okay, thank you. Um, so the first thing that I wanted to just acknowledge is to thank the Douglas PTO. Uh, I was happened to be fortunate. Um, first time I've had a luncheon, but they catered the luncheon for the uh, primary school and the elementary school, and it was wonderful, and I was invited down, and um, I went, and it was good. So thank you, <laughs> Douglas PTO, for that. Um, the only thing I have on the report today is I've asked Mrs. Nasuti to come up as, as she is uh, championing our EL uh, population um, and ask her to give us an update as to where we're at with um, the student uh, enrollments in our schools. How are you? Good, how are you? 
Good. Well, we certainly have had a drastic change in our English learner population since the beginning of the school year, and I think it's important that we all are on the same page and you have an understanding of the drastic growth that we have had. So at the end of last year, um, of the 2016-17 school year, the district only had one former English learner, which we were required to monitor. So we were just making sure that that student continued to make progress and determine if they needed any additional assistance. We had no students that requ required direct services. Um, at the beginning of August, we learned that we had two new potential students that whom language was other than English, and we came forward to school committee and you granted us um, hiring a 1.0 ESL teacher to provide services to those students. Within the first week of school, we learned of two additional students at Douglas Elementary School. Both of those students had been identified as English learners <laughs> at their previous school district. Therefore, we were required to provide them with ELE services as well. So then, on October 12th and 16th respectively, two students enrolled at Douglas High School. And then again, on October 24th, we had a student enroll at Douglas Middle School. All three students' home language survey indicated that a language other than English was spoken in the home. All three students were evaluated, screened by the ESL teacher, and their English language proficiency level did indicate that they re required English learner education services as well. So if you do the math, we have had an 800% increase in our English learner population since the beginning of the school year. Um, you know, at this time, um, we have 1.6 full-time teachers, ESL teachers, that are providing direct services to our students. Um, the students' uh, services depends on their English language proficiency level. Uh, seven of the eight students are considered foundational level students, which um, they are, we are required by DESE requirements to support them with at least two to three 45-minute block periods per day of direct ESL instruction. Um, and then we have one student that is a level four requiring only 45 minutes of direct ESL instruction. Um, so today, the language acquisition team met and we reviewed um, the scheduling and we believe we have figured it out to support the needs of the students at this time. I just wanna caution that if we do have any other students enroll, that we are gonna be in a situation that it would make it very challenging for us to support the needs of all the learners. Um, at this time, we have one student enrolled at the primary school, two students enrolled at the elementary school, three at the middle school. Also, we have the former English learner at the middle school that we're monitoring, and we have two students at the high school. Both of our ESL teachers um, follow the middle high school schedule um, and we've been able to be creative in our scheduling in order to meet the needs. And we think we have it covered right now. Um, just to give you an understanding of the program that we provide, um, Douglas provides a sheltered English immersion program. And with that, there's two components, direct ESL services, which are provided by an English as a second language teacher. Um, outlined as I already shared, you know, depending on their proficiency level. And then we also con, um, provide sheltered content instruction, which is happening by the core academic teachers. They're sheltering their, the content right within the classroom setting. Um, again, it's been a huge change. Um, we're continuing to monitor it. Um, all of the administrators have been extremely supportive in um, helping us with identifying students that need to be screened. Also, the ESL teachers have been really flexible in traveling to the different buildings and helping us implement the programs. Um, we discussed this morning, um, you know, we've always had the plan in place. We really had to put it into action. 
um, and there's been a lot of work going on over the past two months and I just thought, felt it was really important for you to have an understanding as to where we are at right now. I would be happy to answer any questions. So you say this 1.6 is, is obviously one full-time and one part-time. Yes, and actually that <coughs> 0.6 also fulfills a 0.4 at the high school, at the high school. Um, as a French foreign language teacher. Um, one of my questions is, uh, is it across the district that teachers have SEI endorsement or is it spotty? So it is spotty and the reason why is um, so when the retail initiative um, was rolled out, um, and that was based on DESE requirements, right. the retail initiative was rolled out, um, and our cohort was cohort three. And at the time, the only people that were eligible to be SEI endorsed at no cost through the state um, were those teachers or administrators who had an English learner assigned to them at that time. That's a bummer. That year, we had, I believe, one administrator and one core academic teacher that could be endorsed. However, I will say that because of the new requirements for licensure, many of our educators have gone out and have gotten the SEI endorsement on their own. Um, the requirement is, is once we assign a core academic or academic teacher, an English learner, they have to obtain their license, or their endorsement within one year. So by the beginning of the next school year, they have to obtain it. Um, for those, you know, having gone through the endorsement process myself, um, in order to take the course, you actually have to be able to work with an English learner. Right. So um, yeah. that is part of the reason why yeah. as well. So when the, this took place last year, a number of the high school teachers <clears throat> immediately jumped on board, right. and, and um, quite a number of the high school teachers have gone and uh, secured the in, the endorsement. Um, Mrs. Sosha was good enough to arrange through, I, I can't remember if it was French River or if it was Blackstone Valley, but a teachers program 21. that's going to be coming in, Teachers 21 is coming in in February. Oh, good. So we're going to host it so that will allow a number of the teachers yeah. now that are across all of our buildings now the opportunity to jump in and get that, that that taken care of at home. So that's that's, that's a nice thing. Yeah. And Cindy is always sharing different opportunities throughout <coughs> the area for um, SEI endorsement with, with staff so that they are aware of the different opportunities that are available. I'm just, I'm, I'm asking that because I think that this is just the beginning. Yes. And I think that that was the other point that I wanted to make too and I couldn't agree more. Um, given the environmental disasters that have mm -hmm. taken place, um, from what I'm gathering from other uh, districts, um, there has been an increase in the English learner population because people are seeking refuge here. Um, so we, you know, have seen the influx of students already, but I do not believe that this is the end. Um, they've always told us it's coming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It has arrived. Mm -hmm. I have two questions. Yeah. Um, you, you have all the supplies that you need? So we're the currently, um, you know, c reviewing what we will need. Um, the ESL teachers are going to work on the half days to kind of look at the curriculum and see if we need anything additional. We have had to order some bilingual word-to-word -word dictionaries um, for some of our students, which we have been able to cover. Um, we do have some programming that was um, in the district um, from a former program that we ran that is um, applicable to English learners so we're going to use some of those resources as well as the reading wonders and go math programs are aligned and have an L component to it so that will be really um, beneficial but we are going to see what gaps we have and certainly I anticipate having to um, come back and ask for additional resources to support the needs of those students. My second question is um, can you Explain the impact on your everyday job because EL was only a very small portion of what you were doing and special education was the bigger piece. So how has it impacted you and do you see, do you anticipate coming forward and asking for additional help within your department and maybe that's more for Mrs. Urquhart to answer, but 
um, I, you know, just. I think Mrs. Urquhart and I are debating on that right now, to be brutally honest. It has put a significant impact on the department. Um, you know, certainly every time a new student enrolls, it's now taking us away from the other part of our business, um, you know, from my side. And typically I only handle special education and the L portion was a very small part of my duties. Um, and usually it was more annually when we would do the um, state testing. It's the access testing that all English learners have to participate in. And it's fluctuated. Some years we have no students, other years we've had one. Um, so just having to make sure that the materials are ordered and things like that. Certainly with eight students at four different buildings, that's gonna be very different than it has been in past years. Um, I do know that it is, my time has been um, definitely focused a little bit more on L um, when I'm in my office and has put an impact on the special education part of my job a little bit. Um, however, I think it's manageable at this time, but I think we need to watch it. Right, I mean, we went from one to eight in one year. Right. And I mean, I think that if you if we continue to see that type of, there's no way that that Laura can continue to do her job and do this this piece of it, and um, or nor will there be enough staffing to teach them as well. So that's that's why we asked Laura to come is because it has changed so quickly um, that if it continues in this in this direction, then there, there's going to be down the road there might be some needs for additional staffing to support that because right now I don't think that if if we had one or two more students come in I don't see how we could creatively cover them with the 1.6 that we right. presently have especially if they're different um, levels right. their English proficiency right. levels are different we won't be able to group them together the way we have um, it certainly would present some challenges to the scheduling does EL fall under Special education or general no, education? No, general education. General education. General education. It's regular, okay. regular ed. In fact, I was going to make that point too, because mm -hmm. I made it actually several times recently because it's brand new for us, mm -hmm. is it is considered regular education. So again, you cannot use circuit breaker, any funding for circuit breaker. Um, and again, I like to remind people too that Neely and also Laura, um, it, it's, it's student services mm -hmm. so it's it's homeless it's it's el it's it's regular ed it's it's special ed mm -hmm. yes by far special ed education is the largest portion but we need to think a little bit differently going forward because we have to remember that's regular education but a little bit more um, um, extensive uh, service delivery needs um, i actually as assume the role as the english learner coordinator prior mm -hmm. to taking on the responsibilities as the special education coordinator. So I think at this point, it's been about seven years that I've been following the program. And um, again, you know, the growth that we've seen this year is just surpasses any trends that we've seen thus far. And that's why we came is we just want to make sure you were aware that sure. mm -hmm. if, it, if, it, if it, it stays where it is now, <coughs> we should be okay. But if it does change, we would need to come back because it just wouldn't be sustainable with the staffing that we presently have. So I have a couple of questions mm -hmm. to follow up with that. And, and don't take this the wrong way. Mm -hmm. um, what is the difference between the two of you as far as like your job responsibilities? Because I've never really. Go for it. So um, within my job, I'm, I'm actually the student support person. So technically, I am the director of special education, director of 504. Um, director of Civil Rights, uh, McKinney Vento Director, which is homeless. Homeless is. Director of Nurses, um, ELL Director, and Laura is your Special Education Coordinator. So in the majority of districts, what you're going to find is that you have a team chair model. Okay, so that means that, that a district will have, a, a, a district that's this size, will have a special education director or a pupil personnel director or director of student support services, which is me. And then in most districts, you'll see there's that team chair model that each school has somebody that runs your initial eligibility meetings, your reevaluation meetings for special education, sometimes does a little testing like that. We don't have that here. 
um, we have we have Laura, who has assumed the role of really <laughs> four to five people. Um, and at the time of me coming on as the, well, when I came on as the coordinator, um, we had a transition time when the other director had left. So I was still the coordinator and um, I was also acting as the director. We needed somebody to handle that L piece. Um, so Superintendent Lane asked Laura to take that on due to her background in linguistics. So that's where all of this kind of came from. When Laura came on as a special education coordinator, she continued to assume that that role. So um, because it's the two of us, as opposed to, in most districts, what is about six people. Um, Lena took on the early childhood. She did take on early childhood. <laughs> so what, what we've decided to do is we sort of split it um, in the way that I handle the things that I mentioned. And she, she does the majority of L and has done a tremendous amount of work around it. She really has. Um, she really, really has. And um, that's why, you know, you go from zero to eight and you have the quick success that we've had, the way that we've been, been able to roll it out. Well, that was because she had done the work and front loaded. So we didn't have the situation when we were scrambling, which, thank God. Um, so now to answer the question about um, what do we do? <laughs> what's that? What do we do? What do we do? No, uh, you know, right now it's it's. No, I just wanted a little bit more clarification, and I think that that helps me understand that. She, now, she's actually she's more special education. I'm more student so, support. So when you're dealing with EL, yep. um, I guess I'm unclear as to when I associate like the 504 things and all that. That's those are state mandated. Yep, and so things, is right? so English is EL. Yep, but EL. EL, what did you say? English That's Learner Education, education program, program is a state mandated grant. But yet it falls under the regular educational fund. That's but it's just under student support services, so Neely oversees it, and I just handle the day-to-day -day work. Just like the special education coordinator, I do more of the... Um, it's a civil right. ...day-to-day -day function. So, so there's no way that any, none of the funding whatsoever, because cannot come None from. of the funding can come from special no, education. You have to understand that they're, they're coming in with a different language, but it doesn't mean that they're they not needs, ac right. academic. Right. Oh, I understand um, that. I understand that. I'm know? just, it just, yeah. it's it's hard to grasp, I guess. I understand it. It's just hard to understand. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's something else at this point, And that's the reason I, I sort of wanted to come up here. At this point, I feel like everything is growing at a, at a very heightened pace. So what might be a good idea, with Kevin's permission, of course, is Maybe if we define some of these things and, and we define all of the different facets of the Office of Student Support and what's done so everybody, and, and not just do that, but also talk about the regulations and mandates behind it because everything that we do within our office has a mandate behind it and has regulation behind it and law around it. Yeah, because it just feels like the more and more there's all these state rules and now even I wanted to even ask about exchange students um, it just feels like the regular ed keeps getting pushed down, down, sure. down, lower, and then it's like, okay, we can help all these situations, but then now you have the kids that keep going lower, and now we have to help them because now they need help because we kind of not yeah. left them behind, but it's starting to feel like that, and it has nothing to do with you. No, nope. it's, 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 it's frustrating. Understood, understood. You know, to sit yeah. here and continuously be able to say yes, 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 and then somebody comes up with a need and it's like, I'm sorry, we can't. And that's, and it's, you know, it's so hard. And I know it has less to do with Chapter 7 That's funding. what has to do with, yeah, we're um, an outdated funding formula model from 1993, and nobody expected special education to go in the direction that it has. So you're only getting reimbursed based on what the expectation was in 1993, and they haven't kept up pace. Um, so if, if the state would finally fix the funding formula, then you would see an evening out, not immediately, but over the course of years, um, an evening out of funding for special education reimbursements and general education. But this is, and this is what, 
who I've at least been talking about for the past four years, even before I became on before I came on school committee, is that that funding formula has got to get fixed because it's not just our district; it's every, every district area. within the Commonwealth mm -hmm. is drowning, um, and through no fault of our own. So, um, yeah, it, but you're right; it, it's you know unfair. It is. But these are, but it's mandates, and mm -hmm. every child deserves an, ed, an equal education. So that that's where we're at. It's my understanding that if you get to a certain percentage of L's in your district, that you do qualify for different grants and stuff. If you if you reach yes. a certain classified yeah. as yep. a low income yeah. district, yeah, yeah. Well, you got to be qualified and low income mm -hmm. and, and districts under twenty, right, considered low. right. So I'm just saying if we see, you know, there is a, there is a, um, oh, well, we're at yeah. 800% something, right now, it kicks so. in eventually. It's that double-edged sword, <laughs> you know I mean? right? Just like you have with, with mm -hmm. um, needing mm -hmm. extraordinary relief. Yeah. It, you have to expend so much mm -hmm. more funds in order to qualify for extraordinary relief. But when you actually do qualify for extraordinary relief, <laughs> you're extraordinarily relieved. <laughs> and they're unanticipated. That's the right. That's, mm -hmm. right. that's the shoe that drops. Yeah. yeah. Right. Yep. So. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I think the thing too um, is we just we need to keep communicating these things because they are changing. Even even the whole structure of, of special education and the student populations that are coming in are changing considerably so um, what we need to make sure of is we need to make sure that whether to general education or special education that our programs are reflecting the student needs and um, you know that's why it's important to continue to give you guys the information this is new you know the whole the whole L piece is new so this is our baseline data all right so what we do is is we start here um, and, and we start collecting okay this is what it looks like and now we adapt to to what comes in next and um, we go from there. It's so. new to our district. It's not. I mean, new to our district. Yeah. It's not new to the world. You know, we we yep. we were really yes. one of the only districts in Massachusetts that mm -hmm. that did not have students. <laughs> who uh, when I took the sheltered English immersion program, there was a person there whose school had I think twenty five mm -hmm. or thirty different languages mm -hmm. in it. Right, but that mm -hmm. as you get closer into the cities, there's also a lot more, um, I, I want to say funding sources perhaps, maybe mm. more opportunities at grants uh, so than yeah. what we have. Well, maybe the grants, yes, the grant piece, yeah. But it is, I mean, it's, it's a very difficult piece to handle, but we, we're doing a nice job of it. Laura's done a great job mm -hmm. with all it being out in front of it and um, being proactive and, and um, to your credit, you guys realized that we were going to need to do something. We added that additional position, which and now in, in hindsight, I can't imagine where we would be if we hadn't added that position because it really did. Uh, uh, no question, we'd be out of compliance. Absolutely. So, um, but the, the the goal here was for um, uh, Laura to come up and let you know where we are, um, the changes that have occurred since August to um, to the start of November, and uh, just to sort of make sure that everybody's aware that this is it's, it's an issue that we may need to address going down the road a little bit mm -hmm. that was the whole idea okay thank you you're welcome thank you Laura. thank, thank you, you for Neely. everything you've done thank you. and i don't think there's anything else for the superintendent's report so we'll move on to the school business and operation manager's report please okay <coughs> this evening i have for you um FY 2018 budgetary transfer request number five, and basically just moving funds around to cover um, honorariums. You know, after we put in the encumbrances, teachers have moved. So where we originally have them, we just have to move it around. So that's a nice, small and simple one. Um, does anyone have any questions? I'll be looking for a motion to approve, please. Hello. Make a motion. Okay. Make a motion that we approve the FY 2018 budgetary transfer request number five, school committee meeting November 1st, 2017. Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. And I also, um, as promised, I apologize, it did take some time, a little bit longer this year, 
Um, I did print out for you the um, UNIS general fund um, budget report. We have all of the salary encumbrances um, in there. Um, you know, as far as the overall balance, when you look at the very last page, it certainly is lower than we've seen at this time of the year. Um, but I think we all know that <coughs> our budget just gets tighter and tighter each year. Um, but we are holding our own. Um, we've covered, as you know, we've covered a number of things already. Our balances are still looking good. Um, so I feel we're in, in good shape right now, but certainly we're also early, fairly early in the year, too. And I hope that we don't have any snow and it's very warm this winter. <laughs> <laughs> so Me too, for so many and no more, reasons. no more facilities Sitting. issues. Right. <laughs> with, with regard to that last page, so we're, we're at a percentage used of 95.8%. You say so that seems like it's higher than normal for this, at this point in the year. Um, yes, usually the, the available balance is higher than that. But you can't... <clears throat> You know, there can be various reasons for that from year to year, just timing issues, but it is lower than you normally would see this how, year. How but much not lower, roughly? Oh, I don't. I'd have to look at each year. I didn't have, I didn't have time to look at that, to be honest with you. But it's just, it's, I'm not concerned about it. We have a good balance there still. Yeah. You know, it's just that it, it is going lower, and it's going to continue to get that way as we continue to have very tight general fund budgets. So um, we've been living with that for years and years and years. It just gets lower and lower and lower each year, that's all. And a giant concern because obviously we have a, a balance. Thing. So, no, well, well, as you, you know, the discussion that we just had regarding um, that uh, Neely and Laura just came up and spoke about, um, and we'll be probably speaking, I would imagine, Kevin, um, as we proceed throughout the year, and especially when we go into the FY 2019 budget process, um, you know, the needs for, for students and for serving the student population does get. Uh, more and more difficult and it does require a funding there's no other way to deal with any of the needs whether it be student or facilities you know custodial um, whatever it is it takes funding and therein lies the problem the problem is not the expenditure budget in any way shape or form it's just a funding issue and that's not anything new to anybody um, but it just gets uh, more and more difficult and more difficult to manage as I know you guys have seen um, in the past, we had a little bit more flexibility in past two years to even move money around within the general fund, but we really don't have much flexibility anymore, financial flexibility. Um, many years ago, you used to have some, I don't want to call them buffers, to the extent where certainly you did not budget in your general fund like monies that um, you didn't need, but certainly you were able to put in a buffer for, say, what we just talked about, winter is coming with heat in, in, in um, you know, if we have an um, extraordinary year like we did a few years back where we had to hire people in the, the um, overtime for custodial help to, to shovel the roofs, obviously we could not incorporate that in our budget because the main purpose that we're all here is to service our students to the best we can. So we all are very sensitive um, with regard to the fact that we want good, you know, highly qualified, uh, you know, teachers, parents, ABAs, and others in front of our students. That's our primary, primary importance, I think, to all of us, an administrative team, you as a school committee, but it is becoming more and more difficult um, to do that. And so budgeting itself becomes very difficult. It's been very difficult for all of us to make those decisions when we go through the budget process, but um, I'm not worried at this time. This isn't anything new. Um, I know, Brett, you're, you're new to the school side of it, but it isn't anything new. I mean, we do we do struggle with this, you know, no, honestly, every yeah, year and gets worse yeah, and worse. But about it is a funding. It really is a funding issue. It's a revenue. It's a funding issue. It's not an expenditure issue. So, so what it's saying is we have 4.2 percent remaining in our budget going from from this point forward to the end of the year. But keep in mind, we? though, that we have encumbered though all of the salaries, and that's 80. 0.3% of our entire budget. Yeah. Okay, so that's all encumbered and accounted for. Mm -hmm. So that, that's very important to note that. <laughs> okay, so. Um, we, we talked today about uh, the beginning of the process for the budget for yeah. upcoming year and um, talked to the administrators and asked them to have a critical eye mm -hmm. what we absolutely need and it's prioritized, as, as Courtney just mentioned, um, the needs of our students and to try to maintain our staffing levels to the best of our ability, and um, th those are the, the top priorities that they'll they'll build their budgets with. Mm -hmm. um, but that means, you know, that there there might be things that 
would be helpful but if we if they're not something that we think is is going to take away from possible staffing and or, or student needs we just we just we got to pull it away so we're going to we made a commitment to try to keep staffing the way it is for for, for next year as well so that's our goal when we build the budget um, we'll, we'll, no, I, we'll wait. Okay. I, I, just um, maybe a request I, as you're starting to build that budget some, something to think about is to I appreciate that the approach that you're taking yeah. to it but maybe um, keep track of some of the things that you're not putting in the budget mm -hmm. um, maybe a prioritized list of things that we'd love to put this in there but we know it's not feasible right. um, just so we know what's what we're doing without and so, and you, and, and I agree with that. Right, is, and you know that we we presented a, a laundry list that was way right. beyond what we what we funded. And so those needs ha yeah. have not gone away. Um, so, but again, it'll come down to what do we actually have for for funding. So, that's it for you. Yes, that's it. Thank you. Very good. Oh, oh, and you did already take a vote. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, so this evening we do have to have executive session to discuss strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation where an open meeting may have a detrimental effect on the bargaining or litigation position of the school committee and to conduct collective bargaining as well as strategies with regard to non-union personnel. So we will only come back to public session to adjourn. No further business will be conducted. So we will need a roll call vote please. Julie Finnegan, aye. Julian Mulder. Brett Margul, aye. Julian Canero, aye. Sherry Zetlin, aye. And we're done.